Really pleased to be joined by Aaron Rogerson and Alyssa Polizzi of the Golden Shadow Podcast. Hey guys. How's it going? How's it going? Really good. So we've been talking about this conversation for a little while and you've been on a really interesting adventure speaking to a lot of the most interesting kind of thinkers, therapists in the kind of Jungian community about the shadow, the concept of the shadow, which is something we've talked about on Rebel Wisdom a lot and you've made it the focus of your podcast. And so I'd love for this conversation, to, we're gonna play some of the clips from some of the people you've been speaking to, and I'd love for this to be a kind of exploration of why we think it's a really useful framework to understand what's going on now. And a lot of people maybe watching will be familiar with it. Like it had a, a real renaissance back into the culture with Jordan Peterson, for example, talking about Carl Jung's uh, psychology, th thought, and the concept of the shadow. Like before we delve a bit more into it, maybe we'll start with asking you what it is that you find particularly interesting about this concept. Why do you think it's really useful for right now? And how did you become interested in it? The shadow as a metaphor is really useful. It's really accessible when you kind of put forward the concept, the imagery, uh, it makes sense to people like that. Like they kind of understand what you're talking about, even if they can't articulate what that thing is, this concept of the thing that you do not see or the aspect of self that is not claimed as self or the thing that's being left unsaid. So all these ways in which part of our reality is obscured from us, that resonates with people right now, especially because I think there's so much confusion I think people are struggling with sort of uh, an overdose of what feels like low quality information and low quality truth. And this feeling that they, they look at out at the world and they cannot actually see it. Like they look out and they see all this, uh, all this sort of on the surface information, all, on, uh, on the surface uh, explanations of things. And they know that there's something behind it that's not being said that they cannot see. And so I think that's really relevant in our current moment. I think there's also a lot of depth to the concept of the shadow that there's to explore. And this concept, whether it's the shadow or shadow work, has been really rising in the collective consciousness. People kind of throw it around. But at the same time, I think there's a sense of not fully understanding the depth um, and the fullness of what it means. And for us, working with the shadow is to come at it from all of these different angles, to bring in different thinkers from different perspectives, and to really shine a light into these different areas of human psyche and really answer that question, what is the shadow and how does it affect us? Yes, yeah, so something else that I think people will notice if they get engaged in a lot of spiritual communities or spiritual practices and kind of like the guru culture is that there's like a lot of like really positive sort of language of like ascending and uh, everything is love and you know everyone just needs to kind of like uh, embrace love and then we're good but people are reluctant to get into the the dark side of things and get into how much bullshit there is out there and how hard it is to actually become a better person or how hard it is to get a grip on who you are and so there's a lot of um, a lot of ideas being offered that are very what they call like spiritual bypassing, where like you can become enlightened and it's simple, um, and that's ignoring all of this darkness that actually needs to be worked through in each of us. Uh, and people don't want to talk about that because it's scary, but it also uh, you know makes your path forward look like something that is impossible, something that is going to require a lot of work. So. I like the shadow and we've gravitated towards the shadow as a concept because it really does uh, get into this idea of like the path to uh, ascending is actually to go down first, right? You have to, like, to, you have to go through the underworld in order to ascend into paradise. And if you talk to Jungians, they're all about that. Like they get it. They're, they're very no bullshit. And that's something that we appreciate and something that we've gravitated towards in our work. So we talked a while ago in the Stoa about your podcast, about the Golden Shadow. And one of the things that we talked about was potentially going and speaking to a lot of the, 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 big, the big names in the Jungian community, 
people who've been working with these kind these kind of concepts for a very long time. Um, and I know that's something you've gone and, and done. I'd love to hear what you made of that. What was that journey like? And we'll play a few clips from that in a second as well. What 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 did you learn? And what did you yeah? What what was the exploration like? We were really inspired to tap into some of the biggest names in the Jungian community to to begin this exploration really by going back to the roots um, so that we can ask some of these uh, individuals who have been not only studying um, psychology and psychiatry for decades, but also have been on the ground floor with clients and doing their own deep work, really understanding from this deeply uh, personal level what the shadow is, how people are affected. Um, so this this exploration of the shadow, uh, we turn towards those classic Jungians, but also others outside of the field. And what I think I found the most compelling was that we could look at it from all of these different angles. We could ask uh, all of these guests what the shadow was and they could speak to it through these different avenues. And there was always this core element of that dark inner truth that's trying to be revealed, um, the ways in which we're suffering, the ways in which we perpetuate behaviors that cause us a lot of pain and wounding and how that grows from the individual into the collective. And each time we brought a new guest on, not only did we get some of that classic insight, but it also expanded into the modern day. Yeah, you can kind of see how there's a bit of a revival or renaissance, you might say, in Jungian thought. But a lot of people who are throwing around these ideas don't actually understand them very well. And a lot of the Jungian concepts are kind of being um, appropriated in ways that are inappropriate. <laughs> Uh, and so it's interesting to see uh, different generations exploring these concepts. Um, you do have, you know, people on Instagram who are talking a lot about the shadow and shadow work, like that's there. Um, but you also go back to, uh, you know, someone like James Hollis or John Beebe um, or Murray Stein. And there's this rich, rich knowledge base there that maybe isn't being tapped into quite as deeply as it should be. And it's very accessible. And the way that we could actually reach out to these figures and they agreed to come talk to us was surprising. Um, and I think that's part of maybe the opportunity being missed with this kind of resurgence of Jungian thought is like, there's actually all these old school Jungians that have all this amazing insight. There's all this amazing wisdom. There's all these great books and these people are still alive um, that I don't think are being uh, looked at. They're not being mined properly. And, you know, you have Jordan Peterson kind of bringing up these Jungian ideas and people are latching onto that. But I don't think they're doing the proper homework to put these ideas in the context. And so that's part of the, part of our interest is to talk to the people who are still around and that are willing to talk to people. And so it's, it's been really exciting for us to make these connections. Yeah. And maybe let's start by playing a couple of clips from some of the, the people that you had the conversations with. Uh, about what the shadow is. The shadow represents those parts of ourselves or those parts of our organizations, which when we bring into conscious awareness, we find troubling. They may be inconsistent with our values. They may remind us of the things we don't want to know about ourselves. Or in some cases, they can actually be summons to a larger life, which we find threatening and in, in, intimidating. Mm -hmm. So the shadow briefly manifests in four basic ways. Most commonly, it's operating unconsciously. So it spills into the world through our relationships, our choices, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Or we want to disown it, so we project it onto someone else. We call them lazy. We call them overly ambitious. They call, we call them whatever because that way we can, uh, you know, absent ourselves from any accountability of that within ourselves. Or thirdly, we can get caught up in it and just be carried by that energy. And that happens frequently in people's lives and even the lives of countries. And fourthly, it becomes conscious and then we're accountable. We're something now we have to deal with. Jung said something like the shadow is everything we don't want to be. It's those parts of ourselves that we have disallowed, that we'd cut off from, that we um, would rather not know about ourselves. And so we often meet it first in projection on other people. We chose some of the most prolific and uh, well-known figures in the Jungian field. James Hollis, who has been working for decades and released well over 15 books. Lisa Marciano, who runs the popular This Jungian Life podcast. 
Dr. John Beebe, who's done some uh, phenomenal work, um, and others. So it was really about tapping into some of the the, the titans of the Jungian world, uh, but also bringing in some new names. Uh, Chris Gabriel from the Meme Analysis YouTube channel, who takes a really modern approach to these um, imagistic dynamics, the memes of our world, and looking at it from an analytical perspective. Um, so really trying to bring in different perspectives and to explore the shadow. Yeah, I think this is going to be really rich because there's so many different angles and we've, we've chosen different clips to represent some of the kind of aha moments that came up in, in, in the work, in the research that you were doing. Um, I think I'll start by saying why, why I think the shadow is particularly important now. And it actually ties into this shift between broadcast media and, and decentralized media. Like we've talked about, we've, we've had a lot of uh, people on the channel like Jordan Hall talking about the blue church and this, this transition away from a very broadcast way of thinking, which was kind of top down um, into a more decentralized kind of way where everyone can be a broadcaster. It starts to chip away at the authority of those, of those um, legacy systems, but also shows up that a lot of what they thought was reality was actually a kind of low resolution version of reality. There were certain things that were not included. And that what decentralized media allows is all of these different perspectives. And by definition, some of those are going to be the shadow perspectives of, of what was officially kind of allowed before. So you, I think we're in this time where you're seeing all of these shadow dynamics, all of these kind of other perspectives that were kind of growing in the cracks of the low resolution grand narrative of the kind of legacy media or the legacy culture, legacy society. And so I feel like all of that will have to be, all of that now has a voice and all of that will have to be integrated for us to move through in, in some way. W would you say that's a useful frame? Yeah, I think that's actually an interesting framing because even on the personal level, the shadow is kind of something that bubbles up from below and tries to break through. And the ego or the persona is kind of this, this sort of uh, constricting top down thing that tells what's bubbling up to like be quiet or to, to go back down, suppress itself. So it's interesting to see, because this is true, if you look at a lot of this Jungian theory is that what is playing out on the individual level is also playing out on the societal level. So the idea that like legacy media is in some sense like the ego or the persona, the sort of glossy, uh, you know, light uh, kind of narrow message that's being broadcasted forth and that like the decentralized broadcasters are in some sense this bubbling up, you know, bottom up voice that has been suppressed for so long uh, and that's finally starting to break through and that results in kind of a, a societal shadow integration in that way from these decentralized voices, I think it's actually a quite interesting framing. So yes, I agree with that. And it also leads into the question as to whether the shadow, how is the shadow useful to the sort of the broader sort of sense making conversation that I'd say that we're all, a, a lot of probably the viewers are, are aware of kind of people like Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, Jamie Wheel, Jordan Hall, Nora Bateson, um, how, how do you think the shadow is useful to, to making sense of the world? Or why do you think the shadow is a necessary thing to understand or to look at if we're going to be able to understand the world and perceive the world better? You know, the shadow as a concept inherently allows us to turn towards what is being unsaid, what has gone unacknowledged, and what are the, the different tides that are influencing culture and society that drives these sense of disillusionment. Um, what I think is often at the core of the sense-making scene, which is why have things developed um, the way that they have? And why do we find ourselves at certain moments of crisis? And there might be a tendency to just look at what is conscious, what is more explicit, but the shadow asks us to go deeper and to pierce more into that core to see aspects in ourselves, but also collectively that have built over time, that have caused us to lose um, structures of meaning, um, that allow us to feel that we're untethered. And the shadow is a pathway really into that space so that we can utilize 
both our conscious awareness, um, what is more explicit to sense make, but also to invite in those aspects of the shadow so we get more of that holistic picture. Yeah, and I wonder whether we should go on to uh, Michael Mead um, and play a clip from him talking about the, like what, what are the myths or what are the, what are the shadows of the, cult, of the time that we're going through at the moment? So like we, our podcast is called Living Myth. And, and the point is to say we are living in myth with myths. It doesn't matter if people know it or not. And uh, it's there. And, and so one of the old questions is, which story are we living in? Which myth are we living in? And as far as I can tell, we're living in the myth of apocalypse, where the myth of the end of an era, which is also the beginning of an era, but people don't see that part. And so not knowing that we're living in the end of, a, of an era, that we're living in a myth of collapse and renewal, causes many people think that, to think that the world is actually coming to an end. And it causes people to act out the shadow of creation mythology. And what I mean is, when you look at the, um, the extremes in the January 6th insurrection in Washington, D.C., that thing, a lot of those people thought they were coming to uh, the beginning of the end of the world. And they're willing to participate in that and do destruction. Destruction is part of the dynamic of the shadow based on not having real mythology and therefore falling into a shadow type of mythology, which has all the shadow issues in it, in the sense that destruction and violence are acceptable and it's exclusive, denying people of color, denying people that aren't part of the, um, the conspiracy. A conspiracy is what happens when you don't have a living myth. Michael Mead is a mythologist, he's a storyteller, and he's the host of the Living Myth podcast. And his thing is really to try and wake people up to the idea that we are living in myth and they were living with myth and that narrative is sort of an inescapable uh, quality of our lives, that reality itself in many ways is a narrative, it's a myth, it's how we make sense of the world, it's how we sort of organize our ontology in many ways. So he's he's trying to get people to understand that you cannot live without myth. So you could have a, a good functional myth, you could have a good story that you're living, or you could try to escape the idea of having a story you're living, in, in which case your pride is going to fall into either someone else's story, or you're going to fall into some sort of shadow story. Um, so when we see... Um, let's say, the kind of lineages, traditions of the past, they did a good job of providing a functional uh, shared story that people could uh, take on their lives and they could live a better life that way. That's sort of fractured and fallen apart. And people don't live outside of story when that happens. They just find a crippled, bad story to live, a shadow story. And that often looks like uh, a myth of apocalypse where it's the world is ending and there's some great fight between good and evil. Often the good and evil is projected onto a, a group. So my good group versus your evil group. And now there's some kind of apocalyptic battle that we need to fight out. Um, or just sort of uh, the idea of there's some great conspiracy that's controlling my life. The reason that I have all this, this shadow content in my life, this, the reason that uh, I'm not happy and nothing's working out for me is there's some great conspiracy, like the government is following me and, and, and manipulating my life, or there's aliens and lizard people. These are all myths that we're living. And so tapping into a, a personal myth and figuring out what that means and how to uh, organize one's life, organize one's morality around a functional communal virtuous myth is something that I think he's trying to wake up in people. And I think that's really important. To another um, point with Michael, he he's really speaking to this gripping of this archetypal narrative of the apocalypse as, as reigning very supreme at this time, which does drive people towards uh, quite violent and destructive behavior because it really does seem warranted in these type of warring times. But the apocalypse myth um, is part of a cycle, and it's part of a cycle of death and rebirth, and through that destruction comes new life. 
And the element of shadow here is that we've maybe forgotten or lost that connection to that creative regenerative uh, principle that always is coming at the tail end of any element of destruction. So as certain things disintegrate and fall apart, we recognize, recognize that it's also giving space for new development. And when we lose sight of what is also developing and coming into life, it can help promote that sense of destructive attitude, that nihilism that we really, there, there is really no more point to life rather than to uh, pull things down as quickly as possible. And I think one thing Michael Mead is really speaking to here is to remember the creative aspect um, that we can kind of lean into some of that um, element of disintegration, um, not in a way that is imbalanced, but rather as a way of ushering in what new developments are, are taking hold. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of something that Jordan Peterson said um, after Jung, obviously, but be careful which myth you're playing out because you may be playing one out unconsciously that you're not aware of. And I guess Michael Mead is still talking about what are the myths that we're playing out collectively that we're not aware of. What would you, how would you summarize that? What, what does he think we're playing out kind of subconsciously or unconsciously? I think there's definitely the the element of the destructive apocalypse, and we can kind of look around and see that both in the elements of of in, in environments, in countries seeming destabilized, in governments no longer being trustworthy, um, institutions sort of becoming more and more hollow. All of these elements that speak to end times, you might say. And we're kind of living that in a very conscious way, but the, the sort of more shadow aspect to that is that it drives a lot of fear and uncertainty. It, it makes us feel unanchored. We've lost a sense of meaning and what often bubbles up under the surface and then starts to rise uh, through action is this feeling that we can take uh, extreme uh, measures towards uh, promoting that destructive tendency rather than asking ourselves what can be built in the space that the destruction is leaving. One of the ways I think about modern life is that we've lost the sense of vertical imagination the verticality of life. With the World Wide Web and all that kind of stuff, we have a lot of horizontal, horizontal connection. But the connection that's essential to the human soul and the human heart and the human mind is vertical imagination. The idea that the, the curse blessing of being human is to have one's feet on the earth and one's imagination in the heavens. And, and the old idea, which was in myth all the time, because in the ancient myths, you'd see certain characters go up to heaven and come down and all that kind of thing. And the idea was that uh, we were vertically connected to the entire cosmos. A human being is a frail, tiny thing, given the size of the cosmos, which is unknown still. Um, but inside the human, humans were the uh, microcosm of the big cosmos macrocosm, humans are the microcosm. So inside the frail human is a soul with the power of imagination, which is big as, as big as the cosmos. Michael's work has really touched so many different communities. And I think it speaks to the power of myth and that we've lost what that really does for us on a deep psychological level. When we can reclaim these stories, what we're really doing is reclaiming aspects of our own psyche and spirit that uh, sort of operate in the world through narrative and recognize how powerful having a strong, rooted, anchored story is and when we lose that collectively, uh, it, it drives individuals towards that nihilistic attitude. It makes them feel detached and disconnected, not only from themselves and others, but from reality. So his work and everything that he shared speaks to the importance of cultivating collective myth as well as personal myth. Yeah, and let's maybe move on to, to Chris Gabriel. Um, Chris, I wasn't aware of Chris's work until quite recently, and it's absolutely fascinating because he, he takes this sort of mythological Jungian frame of archetypes and applies it to the internet in a way that makes perfect sense if you think about it, because by definition, if archetypes are um, 
as Jung suggested, they're sort of pre-existing um, structures of being or structures of behavior that we are, that have their own attraction. Therefore, they will show up everywhere if you look for them. And of course, the internet would then be a, almost like a, a collective unconscious that will generate those archetypes. And he has this, um, this, this really clever way of kind of looking at meme culture as this is representing something about the, 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 the collective unconscious manifesting itself through the internet. That is really my basic thesis about what the internet is, is as a kind of a spontaneous product of the collective unconscious, where we're able to get a map of it. You know, all of these drives, all of these ideas and thought forms that had previously been repressed are now able to be expressed constantly. Everybody's psyche is now able to make itself known. And so the fact that there are archetypal dramas that are regularly occurring is no surprise. Now that everybody's drive is able to make itself known to a degree, you know, we're, we're, we're witnessing it very clearly. Well, what did you find really interesting about his work? Chris does this really spectacular job of merging these worlds uh, where before you might have only applied this kind of union analysis to fairy tales or mythology. But we have to recognize that these stories and the development of the images in our culture speak to that same element of symbolic and psychological depth that these ancient stories did so that we can look at the development of the latest meme and start to see the cultural influence that speaks both to kind of more explicit, obvious elements, but also to more unconscious uh, archetypes or to certain symbols that are really taking hold in the collective. And when you apply that kind of analytical thought to the, the current internet culture, you also can really see the different shadow elements that are at play. Uh, we can recognize why certain elements of the internet uh, go viral, but at the same time, why there's a lot of drive towards a, a lot of wounding and trolling um, and people not really being themselves. We can take a, a really uh, analytical point of view that reveals an inherent depth. Um, and we also recognize that anywhere um, individuals are really creating and gathering in community. We are going to see elements of the collective unconscious, the archetypal uh, frameworks at play, um, and also the shadow. Yeah, Chris's insight into the internet as being this totally different landscape. I mean, we all kind of know that. That's, that's sort of obvious. The internet changes everything, and it kind of warps reality into this virtual space. Um, but taking this sort of Jungian perspective on that and really taking memes seriously as like an art form in some ways or a manifestation of the shadow or a manifestation of the unconscious, I think is, is really astute. So the internet has this sort of warping effect because it's so disembodying and that's what's really key in, to understanding what's going on, on the on the internet is um, we all have bodies and part of what we are is that we kind of abstract upward into this ego and the ego kind of is convinced that it's everything that whatever I am is just my ego. It's not my body. And we're already kind of walking around doing that in real life, but on the internet, that's greatly expanded. It's exacerbated where everyone has no body and yet they exist on the internet. And so this sort of disembodying effect, um, it maximizes ego. It maximizes narcissism in some ways. It maximizes persona, this kind of happy, shiny face that I have. I mean, Instagram is just like, it's pure persona. How can I present myself into the, to the world that's it's positive. It looks good. It's airbrushed. It's filtered. Um, and when people connect on the internet, they're not connecting with their bodies. And most of what we are, most of our information that we convey to one another, uh, is it's communicated through the body. Even if we're not physically touching, there's still, there's still kind of like proximity, there's body language, there's sort of smell even, and that's all lost on the internet. 
Um, and so his insight that this has these really interesting effects of manifesting strange egoic uh, landscapes of floating heads talking to each other, but also affording this way in which people's um, darkest, most repressed, uh, maybe repressed by self, but also repressed by society, those parts can also manifest because you're disembodied. There's, you can be anonymous. You can have an avatar. You can literally have a virtual body in, uh, you know, VR chat. And there's all these ways in which, um, who we really are is being escaped for what we would like to be. Uh, and so I think that's a really interesting insight and really interesting way to look at what's happening to the internet and how that's leaking back into all of our lives and kind of warping them in these ways that I don't think has really been taken very seriously yet. And were there any specifics that he came up with um, that you thought, ah, that, that makes perfect sense or that really illustrates something, maybe memes that you'd seen that then he gave a framing to and you're like, ah, yeah, that fits perfectly with, with something that you were already aware of or another, an, another archetypal frame that you had already encountered somewhere else? One thing Chris speaks about is the scapegoat and how prolific and prominent that is on the internet. It becomes something that people can rally around and it's usually through some sort of internet interaction that our kind of archetypal reaction to feeling like something bad has happened and there needs to be someone to blame gets heightened and exacerbated. And that becomes the kind of rallying cry around um, an individual or around an institution and the internet in that kind of disembodied way allows us to kind of just dogpile onto the seemingly bad person um, and throw all of these, you know, new narratives around and other people join in. And if you were to think about this happening um, realistically, you know, out in the streets, things would kind of uh, sort of build on themselves in a little bit more of a natural way. You might see the rising of a group coming together and starting to protest or saying this person needs to be held accountable. But the Internet, it allows, you know, anyone from their, the privacy of their own home without even a real name or a real face to join in in this type of mob mentality. And this is archetypal, which is to say that it, it's very much in our human nature to want to look for someone to hold accountable, to look for someone to blame uh, for the scapegoat to be, you know, put in the streets and have that almost like public execution. And now we see that happening on this incredibly wide scale on the internet uh, without any sort of regulation at all. And that tide of it uh, overflowing into the internet space allows sometimes for people uh, whole lives to be ruined without there being a full accounting of what really happened and does the evidence really point to this um, it, it exacerbates that sense of needing um, someone to blame and putting them in in the hot seat. And it, it can be extremely destructive. And I think that's part of what Chris really points out with the Internet is that it allows shadow to build very quickly. Um, it allows it to come out in really wild ways that is a totally different manifestation than we see in regular everyday life. Jung points out again and again and again and again. The mass is the stupidest thing possible. You know, he says you take a hundred of the smartest people, you put them together in a room, and they have the intelligence of a crocodile. Like if they're acting together, they're acting below human levels. They're operating on a literal, you know, the collective shadow. That is all there. They all have, you know, bad, <laughs> yeah. Worse than a crocodile. The crocodile has a, you know, the crocodile, even though they're cold blooded, they have a heart, but the mass, the mass is the worst thing. Um, and online, it just gets worse and worse because there is no, um, you know, there is no uh, justice. There's no vindication for the crimes that we commit online for the most part. Yeah, the sort of mob mentality on the internet is something that he pointed out, which I think is, is, is key, is, um, when people operate in a group or when they operate as um, a mob, there's just a collective of people, they'll naturally sort of devolve into the kind of lowest common denominator um, because in many ways our shadow wants to emerge. It's like looking for opportunities to do so. 
And often if someone else around us is going to let their shadow emerge in the same way, we kind of find this resonance that makes us feel like it's okay or like, sure, like I will let my rage and my aggression or my strange like perversion manifest because I see this other person who's doing it. Um, and that can happen in real life. Uh, you know, when you have like a, a real mob, when people are going crazy and turning cars over, um, that it can be contagious. And the mob develops this sort of, it's, it's, it's a mind of its own, but it's also incredibly stupid because it's, it's gone down to the lowest part of our being. But on the internet, it, something strange is happening again, where it's kind of this flattened, very widespread horizontal contagion where you see someone being nasty on the internet and you realize there's no repercussions and you kind of realize like, well, I can be nasty too. And it spreads. And before you know it, you have this entire landscape of people who realize there's no repercussions for their actions and they can vent all this shadow content. They can vent all this frustration, all this negative energy, all this vengeful energy that they feel towards kind of the vague other. Um, and so thinking of the internet as essentially one big mob or a collection of mobs or a kind of weird landscape of mobs is really interesting. And, and I think you can see that on the internet with whatever is most popular or whatever seems to have the most views or get the most attention is often what we consider to be like the stupidest thing or the most base thing or the, the kind of most immature or animalistic thing that effect that the internet has towards pushing us downward and having us all join in that downward motion, I think is, is, is quite interesting. Yeah, feels that it's a really nice arc to, to because Chris, I think, is, is, has certainly got the most modern, up-to-date framing on, on this and feels like there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of potential there if he could persuade maybe some more of the Jungian community to start getting seriously involved in, in kind of studying memes or looking at memes as this manifestation, it seems unlikely from what I understand of the Jungian community that they would go there. They sort of seem a little bit more, um, yeah, they, they seem a little bit more stuck in the past. Um, and I've heard that the Jungian community is sort of, there's a lot of tensions within it in terms of different interpretations, different sort of schools of thought. Um, what was your impression of, of, of that, sort of the window into the Jungian community um, that that you got from this research project? Yeah, there's there's very much elements of the classic approaches um, in the Jungian community. Um, the the traditional way that Jung did his work is still held as what might be the the proper and correct way, and certain offshoots um, and developments into, say, archetypal um, psychology through James Hillman's work is sometimes look as 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 much too much too much of a departure really from the, the the base foundation of what Jung was doing but what really needs to happen is uh, the space for this evolution to really take hold because there are individuals who are really going to resonate to these classic traditions of Jungian work but just like any institution um, its longevity is going to be defined by its ability to evolve. The Jungian world needs to do that as well. And what I did find, especially with some of the, the older analysts that we uh, brought on to the series, is that they could answer questions from, um, from our guests, um, from the attendees, that had to do with a lot of really modern struggles. And what you start to see is that Jungian thought at its core is extremely adaptable. It can be applied to ancient religion and mythology, but it can also be applied to memes and the way that uh, modern culture is developing. So that speaks to these seeds of potential, um, but there needs to be an openness and an invitation for kind of non-traditional individuals to enter into this space and to be welcomed. And I think that there is both an opportunity for that and maybe a little bit of natural resistance. Um, it certainly can be very difficult for people to get truly into the depths of Jungian work. To even become a Jungian analyst takes years and years of specialized study. Um, and I think in some ways what we're doing with the Golden Shadow is trying to approach it from this kind of decentralized uh, path, which is non-traditional, yet at the same time keeping in mind all of these 
classic theories, um, but making it accessible to people from all walks of life. So I'm still anticipating that we're going to receive some attacks or some major criticisms from the Jungian community at some point, um, people who are defending their turf in some sense, because we're not Jungian analysts, we're not academics, um, we're not therapists, and we're, we're coming at this knowledge base from a place that is different. It's, I mean, we're artists. Um, we're kind of exploring Jungian thought in synthesis with other ideas that have to do with, uh, you know, evolutionary theory um, from different philosophies, different schools of thought, trying to trying to synthesize these Jungian ideas with a lot of what we're learning in the sense making community, for instance. Um, and I think that's part of the power with what we're doing with Golden Shadow is is this this approach that is more accessible. And we've even heard that from Jungian analysts that we've talked to, where they, they say, we take difficult concepts and we make them easy. We dumb them down in a way that's actually really powerful and important. And the average listener can tap into these ideas and be like, I get it. Um, and they can learn something. Uh, so the Jungian community, it is it does seem adaptable because the knowledge base is universal. These truths are universal. They're, they'll always be true. But they do need to be rephrased. They do need to be um, reinterpreted for a new audience. And I think Chris Gabriel, for example, is, is doing a good job of that. Is he's reinterpreting these ideas, um, translating them into a language that can be understood by uh, internet culture. And so we want to tap into these different approaches, as Alyssa said, this sort of decentralized uh, way of making sense of these concepts by tapping into all these people who are innovating. Uh, with these ideas. And that's that's what's really exciting about the the landscape right now and by the internet and by these, uh, you know, these virtue communities cropping up like the Stoa and Rebel Wisdom is that it is tapping into all these different voices coming from all these different places and finding ways to synthesize new ideas, innovate with old theories and make them something that can be uh, uh, digested by a younger audience. Yeah, I mean, something that came up while you were speaking about the Jungian community is there's a conversation that I've been having for a while with people like Paul van der Klee about how Jordan Peterson as a phenomenon was something that uh, we covered a lot in Rebel Wisdom and was, was such a massive cultural phenomenon and probably has mainstreamed the idea of the shadow as much as anything else over the last... And also I think people maybe don't realise how revolutionary or how out there that was. I think Peterson has said that he was advised very many times during his career not to talk about Jung, not to go there because it would be discrediting as an academic to be paying so much attention to Jung. So, so he, was, um, he, he braved that and, and pursued it anyway. Um, and, and I think that connection to Jung has fueled a lot of the the force, the archetypal force that he kind of brought into the culture. But the parallel with Christianity is that Paul van der Klee says that Christianity has largely missed the opportunity, or the Christian church, for want of a better word, has largely missed the opportunity of Jordan Peterson by speaking in a language that people don't really understand, by insisting that his concepts are not properly Christian, or for whatever reason, they haven't managed to tap into the groundswell of interest in Christian ideas that he symbolizes. And I wonder whether there might be a parallel with the Jungian community there. And hopefully not, but I do wonder if that there is something in the nature of these established traditions that means that they're not very good at tapping into the these opportunities and maybe don't even see them as opportunities. They're more thinking of, well, he got that wrong and he got that wrong and he got that wrong. And rather than thinking, this is a great chance to interest a new generation in these ideas. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things going on there. I mean, the first thing is just, um, you know, a turf war. People people naturally defend their turf. If, if you've made a career off of Jungian thought, for instance, um, are you going to take kindly to someone who's deconstructing it? Probably not. Um, that's natural. Um, but at the same time, I, th I think these traditions, these lineages in Christianity, for example, um, the resistance to change is kind of like a bug and a feature at the same time. 
Christianity is powerful, it's strong, because it says the tradition is important, and if you think you understand it, you probably don't. So go a little deeper before you deconstruct it. Go a little deeper before you throw it away or dismiss it. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to adapt or you die. And it's hard to say how to do that properly, but does Christianity need to adapt? Yes. Is it adapting? Yeah. Is it adapting quick enough? I, I don't know. Um, the same is true for the Jungian traditions is they have to welcome the new generation. They have to allow a little bit of deconstruction uh, in service of reinterpretation uh, in, in service of making it accessible to a younger generation. But if they're too open to that, you'll just lose all this wisdom and people will just take things like shadow work and they'll just reduce it down to something that's really shallow, really marketable, and it's lost all of the, the depth that it had if you had looked at it from uh, inside the lineage of Yun. So um, there does need to be an adaptation, yes, but there also needs to be some resistance to... And there needs to be sort of like a, a maintenance of that structure while allowing some fluidity. I think I think both are important. I think you also see both uh, tensions at play in the Jungian community, which is that um, the just resurgence that Peterson has brought to Jung, and all of the the flood of individuals who have this insatiable curiosity to understand him. There is a pushback from some of the traditionalists, which might say that the way that Peterson talks about Jung might reduce certain theories down in a way that's too one dimensional. Um, but it's also given this access point to a whole host of people who have never even heard of Jung's work in the first place. And so is his framing of, say, the shadow in a specific lecture, you know, uh, full of all of its complexity and multiplicity? It's like, well, possibly not. But now they've been given a seed of potential. It's been planted. And now that they can um, have that sense of, of curiosity, they can explore and figure out more of Jung's work. And I think we have to be open to that, that there's in many ways, I'm not sure if anybody can give the full um, breadth and depth of Jung's work in any succinct manner. Um, people can study and read his books for years and years and years and still really struggle with all of the material and the ground that he covered. So we need to be open to the types of individuals who are willing to raise his work up into the collective consciousness and invite others. Uh, the same really could be said for Chris's, Chris Gabriel's work is that you could uh, reduce it down in a way that uh, looks at it as, you know, just meme and internet culture, which is already so vapid and shallow. Like what's the point of looking at it and applying symbolic understanding but what I've seen um, from digesting his own content, the people who are commenting, is that it's expanding their awareness. Now they're curious and Jung and Freud and uh, all of the psychoanalysts. They, they want to read more. Their, their curiosity has really been ignited. And that is what the Jungian community needs to continue to foster. And I think we do see those elements happening, um, which is really going to allow that evolution of Jung's work to keep really taking hold and evolving over time. And do you have any thoughts about where to go next? Um, is it, and also, is there anything that you learned from that experience that you haven't shared that you'd like to share uh, before, we, before we close? Um. One thing I think we learned that's important is that um, a lot of these thinkers will talk to you if you reach out to them in ways that surprise people. I mean, it's we've heard so many people respond to the fact that we got James Hollis and John Beebe with like, wow, like, how did you do that? And it's like we just found their email on the Internet and we emailed them and they came to talk to us and they wanted to talk to us. James Hollis, he seemed excited just to teach. He didn't get paid for this, but he wanted to come talk to us. He's incredibly busy. He had a one hour gap between his clients and he came on and he was happy to talk to us and then he left. And so that's one important lesson about this new landscape that's, that, that is emerging with Zoom and with other, um, you know, kind of webcam communities almost is that there's all this material out there. There's all these people out there. There's so much potential 
that is waiting to be tapped into if people just are willing to reach out and make that connection. And so we're excited at the the possibilities for who else could we talk to and how much um, how many more perspectives can we synthesize into this knowledge base that um, could be powerful for a lot of people. Yeah, I think our aim with the Golden Shadow is to continue to build it out as this venue, as this environment where people from all these different walks of life can come together to join in dialectic and in discourse um, to sense make, to dive into the deep theories, to tap into the mythological realm, to build our logical faculties and do so in a way that um, there's openness to these different ideas. Um, but honoring also these classic lineages that hold so much wisdom and depth and bringing those into the modern day um, and seeing how they really apply. So continuing to expand our conversations with, you know, some of the the classic uh, therapists and Jungian analysts in the field, but also inviting new voices in so that they can share how they've been making sense of the world, how they've been applying these ideas and allowing that to be the kind of holistic landscape that we uh, join in together, which really just ultimately, I think, promotes a sense of, of openness um, and a feeling that all are welcome here to, to join in, in dialogue. And we'd like to aspire to some kind of shadow sense making, to, to innovate with shadow work in these spaces. And there's limitations because it's disembodied, but at the same time, it's a really integral part of um, of sense making, of, of meaning making, of becoming wise, is sort of incorporating shadow work into that process. And so I'm curious, how can we innovate with this in these spaces? Who has some ideas of doing this work together online? What does it look like? Um, what are the possibilities for, for games, for modalities, for collective, um, you know, presencing embodied things that could tap into this, this part of ourselves that haven't been tapped into before. And how can these, these modalities, um, be broadcasted, um, to people around the world for free? There's just so much potential there. And then the idea of shadow work becoming something that's hip, becoming something that's cool, becoming something that is widespread around the world, I think could do some serious good. And so we're really excited to see what the possibilities are there. Aaron, Alyssa, thank you so much for making time and see you soon.